my computer. And I am beginning the webinar. Wonderful, we're having everyone come in and join us and uh, we'll begin shortly. Welcome everybody. For those of you who have just joined us, we're letting everybody know we'll be starting in probably another minute. We've just reached the one o'clock hour. For those of you that are online with us, please feel free to uh, enter in the chat box um, who you are, where you're from. It's always nice to uh, interact with our attendees to get a little bit of a, a vision of where you're all coming from across the province, across the country, or perhaps from another part of the world. So we're always excited to uh, see where everybody's from. We'll just give one more moment for everyone to join. I see a few more people are just getting logged on. So I want to get everybody in and ready because we've got some great information to share today, as always. I guess we are going to begin. So welcome everybody and good afternoon from Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. I am Mary Shakuri and thank you for joining us today on our webinar series, uh, part of our Financial Literacy Month. And today we're going to be talking about why a trusted contact matters. And we are doing this in partnership with our partners at uh, the Ontario Security Commission. So we'll just advance to our next slide. Perfect. And we'll begin with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land one that is based in honor and deep respect. Thank you. And just to give a little bit of our webinar housekeeping tips to let everybody know, everyone is muted during this webinar. So all the attendees are muted. Speakers will be visible while they're presenting. And of course their cameras will be, be, will be back on for our Q&A session. We have our wonderful ASL interpreters with us today and they will be switching back and forth uh, seamlessly. So no need to have to worry about that. You will be able to view them on the right hand side of your screen. And if you need to adjust your speaker images, you can drag the line of the image from the frame and that slides to the left. And there you can adjust at the beginning to whatever viewing type works best for you. 
as well as to let everyone know, please keep the chat box flowing with any comments during the webinar, but we'd love for you to please place your questions in the Q&A box. This really helps us able to narrow down and focus in on the questions that you'd like to address to our speakers at the end of the webinar and have the chat box for comments uh, throughout that, the time. We always record our webinars as we're doing right now. So for those of you who may have to leave early or would like to view this at a later date, within 48 hours, it'll be available on the Elder Abuse Prevention website. So not to worry, it's all being recorded. And the evaluation form will pop up at the end of the webinar. And I know many of you have joined us for several webinars. So even though you filled out an evaluation in the past, please feel free to fill out one again. For those of you new joining us today, the evaluations really help us for future webinars, understanding what our audience appreciates and what they need, because this is about everyone and, and their needs here in Ontario. So please take a moment to fill out the evaluation at the end of the webinar. And for privacy and confidentiality, we do appreciate that there are personal circumstances that people need to speak about. However, we do ask that you keep this confidential during the webinar, and you can reach out to us at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario to speak confidentially and more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and other than having that put into the chat box. So we know everybody understands this and appreciates and respects everybody's privacy. And without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three guest speakers today. Chris Allen is with a partners with community groups and organizations to deliver investor education and fraud prevention workshops. Her financial expertise includes adult training, curriculum resource development, relationship management, and community outreach. I've had the pleasure of working with Chris many times. Prior to joining the OSC, she worked at the Toronto Stock Exchange. Christine graduated from Ryerson University and Ontario Institute for Studies and Education of the University of Toronto. Jennifer Lee Michaels is a senior advisor on the policy and initiatives teams at the Investor's Office. Prior to joining the Investor's Office in 2020, she worked with the, OAs, the OCs, the OSC's Compliance and Registered Regulation Branch after working in private practice advising registered dealers, advisors, investment fund managers on a variety of securities and law matters. Jennifer graduated from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law in 2012, and she was called to the bar in Ontario and in British Columbia in 2013. Welcome, ladies. And finally, Rianne Rideout, who has worked with Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario for the past 18 years. Her experience in working in the field of elder abuse includes delivering training to frontline service providers, providing public education to older adults, facilitating partnerships between community organizations and services, government and senior organizations at not only a local but a provincial level. At a national level, she enhances the response to intervention to older adults at risk and who are experiencing abuse. Rianne has also served on the board of the Canadian Network for the Elder Abuse, and we are honored to call her our Director of Partnerships and Relationships at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. Thank you. I will now hand it over to Rianne, and I hope everybody enjoys the, ne the next 45 minutes of information. Thank you, Mary, for uh, the introduction and for doing uh, the housekeeping and, uh, and welcoming everyone to this uh, great webinar today and to uh, and Chris to Jennifer for joining us as well. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview of um, financial abuse preventing uh, tips and just recognizing financial abuse. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues at the Ontario Securities Commission to give an update on the, the new legislation that's coming into effect at the end of December. So for those who haven't joined us before, um, just quickly going over our organization and what our mandate is. Um, at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, our our mission is to make sure that seniors are free from abuse, have a strong voice, feel safe and respected. 
And I think the one uh, key message in both of our presentations today is that everyone has a role to play um, in terms of, you know, speaking up, um, doing some action, assisting an older adult, starting a conversation with someone you may be concerned about, or, and playing a prevention role um, in protecting the rights and well-being of older adults, particularly around their finances. So um, as we go through the presentation um, today, if there are things that, you know, might um, alert you to something that's wrong, um, to empower you to maybe take action, speak up, um, and take and take a role to help prevent further uh, abuse or harm from being done to a person. As um, our organization, we implement Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse, and we've been doing that since 2003 when it became um, a, a program for the Ontario government. Uh, we are funded through the Ontario Ministry of C um, Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility, and with the strategy, we have three main priority goals. The first one is the public education and awareness. So we do a lot of uh, province-wide public education campaigns, including World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. We do training for frontline staff. So we will work with individual organizations and agencies to train their uh, staff within different various sectors. And we play a role in trying to coordinate community services to enhance the response to abuse prevention and assist individuals in the community across Ontario. In some cases, as uh, uh, Mary indicated, we do a lot of work uh, across, um, across jurisdictions, not only within provinces, but also um, across borders and in terms of the United States. So we try to collaborate on many initiatives um, to enhance the work that we're doing as well as uh, across their work across um, uh, different jurisdictions. Because working together, as we know, um, can help prevent this uh, issue. Um, we need to work as a, as a, as in a global response to abuse because it doesn't just happen within Ontario, it happens across the world. So in speaking of that, we look at the World Health Organization as our definition for elder abuse. And as they define it, it's a single repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring when there's a relationship of trust um, that causes harm or distress to an older person. And the key words within that definition that we really pay attention to is that relationship of trust. So that can be anyone that person trusts and, and causes harm or distress. Um, and that can be different for each person depending on um, um, what is happening. So one person's you know, the way someone talks to someone, they may not consider that uh, harmful or cause them distress where it may affect another person. So it's very individualistic. And I think we need to pay attention to how, um, when we do see somebody, um, how that in the, there are words and actions can impact someone. And with the World Health Organization, the studies that have been done indicate that one in six older adults experience some form of abuse. So that's pretty alarming when you think about the statistics. And the studies that we've done in Canada indicate about 8.2% of seniors experience abuse. And that's a prevalence um, study that was done in 2015 um, by the National Initiative for Care of the Elderly. And what they found within that prevalence study in Canada, talking to um, older adults, was that financial abuse was it came in about 25.2% of the cases that they, they identified as affecting them. Now, you see that emotional abuse was a little bit higher, um, but financial abuse was pretty high um, in the rankings as well. So the one thing that's important to think about when we're dealing with elder abuse is that usually a person will have uh, different uh, experiences of financial and emotional, maybe at the same time, because if someone has stolen your money, or frauded you, you're gonna have emotional impact as a result of that. And the same with the other forms of abuse, but today we're really focusing on, on that financial abuse. So as I indicated uh, just previously, we have the different forms of elder abuse include financial, emotional, physical, sexual, and neglect. And we, we pull sexual abuse out of physical because I think it's important for us to um, pay attention to that form of abuse. Um, it is happening. It does happen to older adults. And um, 
you know, there's different signs of, uh, of abuse that we need to be aware of when we're talking about sexual. So we talk about all different forms uh, of abuse. And again, as I said, they may happen, multiple forms of abuse may happen at the same time. So for our purposes today, we're going to focus on just financial abuse. And when we define financial abuse, we are looking at um, improper conduct done with with or without informed consent. And, and I'll talk about that in terms of the, that sometimes confuses people, but we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But it's with or without informed consent that results in monetary personal gain for the person who's taking advantage of you. So the without, with consent means, you know, you've given someone maybe your power of attorney and you've entrusted them to act according to your best wishes and they fail to do so, um, taking your finances. Um, and without consent is, you know, that fraud and theft that we hear about of individuals taking advantage of individuals, financial bank accounts, uh, financial investments, which we'll talk about in uh, after my presentation. Um, anything that's of property or value to the individual is being taken away from them without their consent. And what we've seen with COVID is a significant impact of financial abuse happening to older adults. Uh, they've disclosed that they have some significant financial losses. Uh, individuals may have uh, maybe moved back in with their, with their uh, pa um, parents who may be of age, they've lost income, um, they may be taking financial resources or the older adult um, has been coerced into giving financial resources. Uh, whatever that situation that we know that individuals have been impacted significantly from COVID, um, from this, and particularly with isolation, that many older adults during COVID were maybe have relied on other people to do their banking because they weren't able to get out, um, not feel safe going out maybe to the bank. So they've said, you know, go to the bank and, you know, they're supposed to give your, your PIN card or your debit card to someone. They may have disclosed that and someone's, you know, helped themselves more to their financing than what was agreed upon. Um, and again, maybe not the ideal situation, but during COVID, people did what they had to do to, you know, make ends meet and get groceries, etc. So I have a, um, a quick poll question here um, that I have, I wanted to put up. Um, so... I'm just going to launch this. So who do you think the main perpetrators of financial abuse are? Um, just take a second to uh, add your comments here and see, uh, we'll see what the results are. Um, I think we have about 94 people online right now. So I'll just give a couple seconds for people to input um, their responses. I always find it interesting to do polls because it keeps it a little bit interactive during the presentation and just to see what other people um, responses are. So I'm just gonna end the poll and share the results. So you'll see uh, most people are, are pretty correct actually. So most people are saying 97% of individuals say the adult child, some say a neighbor or a spouse. Um, so you're correct. So when we look at the perpetrators of financial abuse, uh, the majority are adult children or grandchildren in 37% of the incidences. And this was studied that was done in British Columbia um, that, uh, that looked at financial abuse. So, um, and even the situations that we get reported at our office, a lot of the times is uh, a family or um, a person of uh, a sibling, which is a son, daughter, or granddaughter, uh, a grandson that's related to the individual uh, older adult. But we know that perpetrators also can include uh, a family or, uh, or sorry, of a neighbor or a friend. It could be that caregiver that's supporting the individual. Um, and it could also be a professional. So they also can be in situations where they may take advantage of an individual's uh, financial well being. And just to quickly go over some of the signs of um, the profile of those who do take advantage of individuals. So when we're thinking about the, the grandchild or the adult child, and when I say adult child, we're not talking about maybe someone in their 20s, that might be the grandchild, the adult child is in their 50s, late 50s, maybe even in their 60s, because the aging parent might be in their 80s or 90s. So, um, so when we say adult child, we're not talking about children, children. 
Um, so individuals may have had uh, previous experiences of abuse. Ageism is a huge factor that we see in, um, in abuse situations. And we've done many webinars on ageism. There's the risk factor of maybe living in low income or poverty where they may not have financial resources to look after themselves. So they are dependent on the older adult for their basic needs. There may be issues of depression or mental health issues that may limit a person from um, maybe seeking employment. So they may be relying on someone else for their finances if it's done in a manipulative way. If the person's agreeing to it, that's not abuse. But if it's you know, a coercion issue, then there's that can be con conceived as uh, or and maybe legitimized as financial abuse. The person also could be, um, you know, socially isolated and maybe controlling. We see power and control as a main factor in all forms of abuse, um, domestic abuse, child abuse, including elder abuse as well. And those who are victims of financial abuse, we find are uh, women. Um, not to say that men are not financially abused, but uh, a lot of older women um, are victims of abuse. Uh, individuals uh, within the LGBTQ2S plus um, uh, community, as well as with women disabilities or um, individuals uh, with communication. So today we have ASL. So those who may have um, uh, limitations in terms of their ability to communicate, um, people taking advantage of, they're not listening to the person, they're not taking their considerations into, a, uh, into um, uh, acknowledging those or listening to them. So even people with dementia or cognitive impairments who may not have a voice, thinking that no one will understand, no one was going to report it, people don't know how to, uh, not capable of doing that, so they become victims of abuse. Um, people are also, again, some of these uh, factors... Um, crossover around depression, isolation. Um, they may be living with someone with addiction. So uh, it's sometimes also hard to speak up. And that's common across a lot of uh, the victims. That empowerment piece can be difficult when it's your adult child, it's your family member who may be doing um, the financial abuse to you. So one of the things that we try to do is educate people around how to become empowered um, and knowing your rights and coming to these kind of workshops help people gain understanding of what their rights and abilities are to combat um, and address the issues of uh, abuse, including financial abuse. So when I talked about power and control, that's really uh, an important uh, concept to understand because somebody's using an older adult's money contrary to what their wishes and best interests are. So they're doing it for their own personal gain and they can manipulate people. It's that undue influence that people take advantage of the person, whether it's directly or indirectly. It could be by yelling, or threatening a person. It could be just even by their stance. If someone's six foot tall and another person's uh, shorter and they're standing over top of them, that's an intimidation feeling that people feel like they don't have, they, they don't have control. They don't know what to do or how to say anything. Um, so that is a big factor in financial power that people say, I know better than you. Um, you know, I, I work in the bank, so I know that you should do this, right? So they may believe them, but feel not empowered to speak up um, because of um, just the way that the person's talking to them. So it's important to know what the signs are. How do we recognize the warning signs to take um, action when we see certain things happening? So if you're in your community or in your own family, some of the things that we need to pay attention to. And I know that uh, our other speakers will probably allude to the issues around diminished signs of capacity because it is a significant risk factor when we're thinking about finances. Um, but we use that term very broadly. And I think that we need, from a financial point of view, we need to understand what that means. Um, and so from financial um capacities, like, is there confusion or unfamiliarity with basic financial terms? And I say that, but we also have to understand where is that for that individual, because basic financial terms may be very, come by very easy for, um, uh, let's say myself, but I have a, a friend who doesn't understand banking at all, but that doesn't make the person incapable. It's where they're at. If they used to understand basic financial concepts and now that's changed, 
then maybe there's some capacity issues happening. Um, so if the person never knew it before and they don't know it now, you can't say that there, there's confusion because it didn't have a baseline in the first place. So I think we're really thinking about capacity. We really have to think about what the person understood initially um, and where that person is at, what their executive functioning is around financial capacity. So the list here, I'm not going to read all of them, but there could be, you know, um, basic math problems. Um, do they understand the approximate value of their property? And we know that that with, with market right now, we know that that changes um, can change on a dime, right? Property values with COVID in some areas have skyrocketed. So again, looking at, do they really know uh, the approximate value? Because, you know, they may, but if it's, you know, really, really low, maybe they don't understand if it's maybe back from the day that they actually bought the house, you know, 50 years ago, and they don't understand um, the inflation, things that have happened in terms of our market. Um, there's a difference between uh, understanding that. So we have to look at each of these individually. And I've talked about trades um, that our speakers will talk about the, the trades and, and investments uh, in more detail. But things around red flags, changes of powers of attorney, ish, money that's gone missing from someone's bank account, someone's, you know, stolen their pension checks, um, forged documents, uh, going to the ATM without, you know, taking large money, uh, sums of money. Um, I always ask individuals, seniors, when they're going to, um, you know, when we go to checkouts, the question that uh, these uh, ATMs always ask, or not ATMs, when you go to like a cashier, the question is if you always want cash back. Well, if someone's, you know, doing your banking or your POA, are they taking extra money out without your consent? Um, do you see the receipts coming back? And if they're going out to assist you, are you getting copies of your bank statements? Are your financial records? Um, you're entitled to those. Even if someone has your power of attorney, you're still entitled to having access to those statements um, in your bank account. So these are just some red flags that we, we address. Um, and again, being aware of um, your current assets and your own belongings. So if someone's refusing for you to have access to your funds, so if someone's your power of attorney and managing your funds and you need um, depending on how you've written up your power of attorney, um, you still have permission and access to that and that money. It doesn't give them total control. You, they could maybe manage some parts of your assets, but doesn't give them the fact that you have no control left. So we do whole presentations on powers of attorney. And I think, um, as they say, I think our speakers will talk about that because it really goes into this trusted contact person um, as we move into the Ontario Securities Prim Commission's presentation, um, because who you trust and who you identify to speak on your behalf and manage finances in terms of powers of attorney um, is really important to make sure that they do have your best interests at heart. So understanding your financial affairs goes a long way, not only within you know, your personal banking, who you identify, um, but who, who you can trust um, to act and speak on your behalf when you need to. So I'm gonna turn it over to the uh, um, uh, Christine and Jennifer to continue the presentation. Thanks, Rianne. And hello, everyone. As Rianne mentioned, um, my name is Chris Allum, and I'm here together with my colleague, Jen, Jen Lee Michaels. And we're going to, going to talk to you a little bit about why a trusted contact person matters. We'll also, um, let me just change the view. There we go why a trusted contact person matters, some um, resources, and then we'll turn it back over to Rianne to um, also talk a little bit about resources and what you can do in the, in the event of um, elder abuse. So that being said, I just wanna start off by explaining a little bit about the Ontario Securities Commission and what we do. We're a government agency and we are responsible for um, regulating the capital markets in Ontario. A key part of our mandate is to provide protection to investors. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by 
you know, ensuring that people have access to good education. I and Jennifer, myself and I, myself and Jennifer, we work for the investor office within the OSC. And within the investor office, really, we like to say that we um, represent investors, we're their voice, you know, we have a team of people that we work on um, education and outreach. I'm part of the outreach team. Um, Jen is part of the policy team because we develop policies to help protect investors. And we also have a research team because we need to understand what are some of those challenges that Canadians are facing with respect to managing their finances. Protecting seniors is really a big part of what we do, protecting investors. Um, we work with um, an expert committee, Seniors Expert Advisory Committee, where we have um, experts from the medical field, legal field, seniors advocates, helping us develop policy. We also, with our education team, we develop a lot of resources and certainly policy amendments. And that's really why you're listening today, because you want to learn about some of those latest policy amendments that are affecting or will affect older adults, older investors. So today we'll touch briefly on the financial elder abuse problem, some of those signs that um, Rayanne had shared, what is a trusted contact person and how that can help you, and then resources. So what do we know about financial elder abuse? You know that one in six um, have experienced some form of abuse, but with respect to financial abuse, 7% of older adults have experienced it within their community. What's troubling is also 14% of them and their proxies have reported financial elder abuse in an institutional setting. So we know this is a big problem and we know it's out there. And we also know that many of us, we have an older adult in our lives. And as Canadians, you know, one of the things is we're really private about our finances. We don't normally talk about money matters um, with just anyone. And even with people that are close to us, we are not talking about financial matters. And what are some of those barriers that are preventing us from talking to those older adults in our lives in particular? Well, 38% of us say that, you know what? They have it under control. And we know that as we age, you know, um, we are faced with health challenges, physical challenges. And when you add to that, that, you know, financial decisions at any age is not difficult compounding health issues and other challenges, then it just becomes um, a nightmare for some people. And the other thing is we also know that 37%, because it's a private matter, we're not gonna talk about finances with anyone. We're just not comfortable. And then a third of us say that, you know what? Finances don't come up in conversations because it's just not something we do. So we know that people are not talking about their money then we see that, you know what, a third of Canadians know someone that has been, um, uh, that has experienced financial elder abuse. And I know that in speaking with friends um, that know what I do, they tell me about people that they know of that have been um, financially abused. So we know it's out there. But we also know is that, you know, and you in particular, this audience that we're speaking to, you know that the, the abusers are really someone they know. General public also recognize, 81% of them recognize that it's usually someone that is close to the older adult that is um, abusing them. So it is a big problem. In addition to that, we have investment fraud. And there are different types of frauds out there. But when we look at investment fraud, approximately 50% of those victims are over 55. Now, last year, Canadians reported losing 16 and a half million in investment fund. And you think, okay, you know, considering that the number of Canadians, maybe not such a big number. But then when you think about it and you hear that only 5% of fraud cases are reported, then that tells you that might be a much bigger problem. Now, what does financial elder abuse look like? You know it's when someone betrays that older adult, abuses their trust, and really is taking advantage of them and, and taking advantage of their finances or their valuable, their property for that person's own benefit. 
So what can this older person do? How can they protect themselves? First one is by staying connected. We know that we're in this pandemic and I'll be honest, this pandemic does not seem like it wants to go away. So one of the things that we have to do is ensure that, you know what, we're all staying connected. And particularly if you're an older adult, it is more challenging, but really you need to be connected so you're not isolated. The other thing is you wanna keep your personal information safe. Um, we're doing everything online. We have PIN numbers, passwords. And you know what? It's really difficult to remember these things, but you only want to share this information with people you trust. You know, there are certain things that we can do to make our finances easier. And one of those things is by setting up automatic payments for bills and deposits. Then when you do that, you can easily review your statements to see if there's any problems. We did some research studies and we found that I think it was approximately 26% of investors that have reported that they don't understand uh, financial documents. And, you know, sometimes we're faced with financial documents, legal documents, and we have to sign. And what I'm going to say is that, you know, there's a lot of jargon in there. And before you sign anything, it's really important that you understand it. So if you have to sign documents, then you want to get someone to sit down and review these documents with you before you sign them so you understand what it is that you're signing and agreeing to do. And then lastly, we always say, you know, talk about financial matters with someone you trust. Because that is another step in helping to protect yourself. So that being said, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jen, and she can talk about a trusted contact person in temporary homes. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to Elder, Elder, uh, Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario for inviting us to speak on this panel. Um, so if you could advance to the next slide, please. So over the last few years, we've been working with securities regulators across Canada to develop a regulatory framework to enhance the protection of older and vulnerable investors. And in developing this framework, we engaged in extensive research and stakeholder consultations, which revealed a number of important considerations uh, that Canadians are living longer than ever before and older Canadians are making up a growing proportion of the population. That market and economic trends indicate that Ontarians will be called upon to make more complex financial decisions later in life. But for many health, mobility and cognitive changes that occur with age may affect their ability to make these judgments later in life as could susceptibility to financial exploitation and fraud. And that given the client relationship, financial advisors can be well positioned to notice warning signs of diminished capacity relating to financial matters and suspected cases of financial exploitation. And that with, given, with the right tools, uh, financial advisors could play an important role in protecting their clients against financial harm. Next slide, please. So with this information to guide us, we published the OSCE Senior Strategy in March of 2018 to reinforce the OSCE's vision of a stronger and more secure financial future for all Ontario seniors. The regulatory framework I'd like to walk you through today is a key element of the Senior Strategy. This past summer, uh, we published final amendments to securities regulation designed to outline how financial advisors can address situations involving diminished mental capacity or the potential financial exploitation of their clients. And the final amendments are composed of two key components, which will come into force on December 31st of this year. The first is a requirement for financial advisors to take reasonable steps to obtain the name and contact information of your trusted contact person, as well as your written consent for the advisor to contact the trusted contact person in certain circumstances. The second component uh, consists of specific conditions your financial firms must comply with when placing a temporary hold in circumstances of financial exploitation or lack of mental capacity. So what is a trusted contact person? A trusted contact person is a resource for advisors to help protect your financial interests or assets when responding to circumstances of possible financial exploitation or concerns about your mental capacity. 
They're essentially intended to act as your emergency contact person. Trusted contact persons can also be a resource for the advisor to confirm your contact information in circumstances where the advisor is having difficulty reaching you or to make inquiries about the name and contact information of your legal representative. In deciding who to appoint as your trusted contact person, we encourage you to pick somebody you trust, someone who knows you well, and someone who has the ability to engage in potentially difficult conversation about your personal situation with your financial advisor. And while you can choose to appoint your power of attorney as your trusted contact person, we would recommend that you choose somebody who is not involved in your financial decision making process to add that second layer of protection to your account. And you can name more than one trusted contact person or name different trusted contact persons for different accounts. Uh, and we would encourage you to let them know that you've appointed them so they're not caught off guard when your advisor reaches out to them for assistance. And how does a trusted contact person differ from a power of attorney? This is a question we receive quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the trusted contact person is intended to be sort of an emergency contact, whereas with a power of attorney, you can authorize uh, this other person to act on your behalf to carry out specific actions like paying rent or insurance premiums or to manage your finances more generally. A trusted contact person, on the other hand, is not permitted to direct trades or otherwise make financial decisions on your behalf. And when might an advisor reach out to the trusted contact person? So Rayanne went through some of the red flags of financial exploitation and diminished mental capacity. And some of those warning signs are listed on this PowerPoint slide. Uh, you know, um, financial advisors are not expected to be medical professionals or experts in identifying financial exploitation, but they can play an important role, uh, you know, in identifying some of the warning signs just given their their uh, their relationship with their clients. So, uh, so the, going back to the previous slide, sorry, um, you know, if for example, a client starts requesting significant amounts of cash to be withdrawn without explanation, or maybe the client's power of attorney makes requests that seem counter to the client's interest. A trusted contact might, might uh, you know, as I mentioned before, could be a resource when the client exhibits confusion or unfam unfamiliarity with previously understood basic financial terms and concepts, and then requests a transaction that's out of the ordinary. Next slide, please. And depending on your written authorization and depending on the specific circumstances, an advisor may contact the trusted contact person to discuss a number of things. For example, they may discuss concerns about your mental capacity to make financial decisions or facts suggesting that you might act in a manner that might jeopardize your assets if you don't get help. There may be signs of financial mistreatment observed in de dealings with you or with your power of attorney that might be shared with a trusted contact person or about facts that cause the advisor to believe that you might be subject of a scam. And depending on the circumstances, the trusted contact person could provide support in a variety of ways, such as uh, providing information to the advisor, or they might intervene with you directly or get you the needed help. They may also involve law enforcement or organizations like Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario or the provincial, provincial Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee if there's concerns about financial exploitation or abuse. And we would remind you at this point that you have the right to define the circumstances in which a trusted contact person might be contacted and the scope of information that may be shared with, with them. So if you have questions or concerns, please discuss them with your advisor. Moving on to the second component of the amendments, the temporary hold. A temporary hold is intended to be a tool that can be used to protect your assets where a firm reasonably believes that you're being financially exploited or that you don't have the mental capacity to make financial decisions. An important note is that there's nothing in securities laws today that prohibits firms from placing temporary holds. And in fact, many firms place temporary holds where there are sus suspicious circumstances. And what the amendments will do come December 31st 
is prescribed specific conditions a financial advisor and firms must meet when placing a temporary hold in these circumstances. And the specific conditions will require firms to, for example, document the facts and circumstances that cause them to place the hold. They'll also be required to provide you with notice um, of the temporary hold and the reasons why the hold has been placed. Uh, firms will also be required to review the relevant facts as soon as possible after placing the hold so that they're not just sitting on an indefinite temporary hold. Um, and that uh, if and every 30 days, they, they must either revoke the hold or provide a further notice to you, the client, of their decision to continue the hold along with reasons. When placing a temporary hold, firms and advisors are required to act in a manner that's consistent with their obligations to deal fairly, honestly, and in good faith their, with their clients. And a hold is not intended as a hold on the entire account, but rather as a temporary hold over a specific trade, withdrawal, or transfer. In transactions unrelated to suspected financial exploitation or lack of mental capacity should not be subject to the hold, and a temporary hold should not affect the payment of regular expenses, such as monthly bills. As I mentioned before, some firms are placing temporary holds today in circumstances of suspected financial exploitation or diminished mental capacity. And during our public consultation process, we heard some unfortunate examples of real life scenarios where vulnerable clients are financially exploited sometimes by strangers and other times by their loved ones. But today I'll share two of these scenarios where a temporary hold was placed in order to preserve the client's assets. The first case related to a terminally ill investor who named his daughter as his substitute decision maker in a power of attorney document. And as the power of attorney, the daughter attempted to sell all of her father's mutual funds and transfer the balance to their joint account. Due to the father's poor health, the advisor couldn't re reach him to confirm and refused to redeem his holdings as they didn't agree that the power of attorney could be used to carry out this transfer. And after a month of the initial transfer request, the advisor found out that the father had passed away the day after the request was made. In the meantime, the daughter kept contacting the firm to transfer the funds. The advisor refused as after the father's passing, the power of attorney was no longer effective and the advisor was only obliged to deal with the executor of the estate. The second case um, involved an elderly client who instructed the advisor to transfer funds to his, his wife in a foreign country. Uh, the client had already sent hundreds of thousands of dollars from his account to this individual. And on further investigation, the advisor discovered that the client had never met this individual and that this was a scam. The advisor contacted the police who started investigating the matter and provided provide proof of the scam to the client, which the client just refused to believe. The advisor also received a call from the scam artist who applied pressure tactics for the release of the funds. And if the advisor didn't place a temporary hold, it could have resulted in dispersing the funds to benefit this individual the advisor knew was perpetrating a scam. And once the money leaves the accounts, it's usually, it's usually gone forever. So to summarize, um, if there are four key takeaways from, from you know, our presentation, um, the first is to consider the possibility that you may one day become incapable of managing your own finances become vulnerable or become a target of financial mistreatment. You know, this is this is a difficult thing to think about, um, but planning for your future and just adding protections to your account is key if, if it does ever happen. And in terms of adding protections to your financial well-being, you know, appointing a trusted contact person could be one of those uh, added protections. And we would encourage you to speak to your trusted contact person, your power of attorney, your financial advisor, the, your whole team of people supporting you about your wishes and expectations for the future. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, raise them and have your voices heard. And with this, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, Jen. So I'll just spend um, the next minute or two just sharing with you some resources where you can get additional information. Oops. So 
at the OSC, we have a website and it's called getsmarteraboutmoney.ca. That is our website. So we're, uh, we're providing you with unbiased information. So what kind of information would you find on getsmarteraboutmoney.ca? Well, certainly you will find information about a trusted contact person. You can find information about dealing with your um, financial representative. Um, we have a section that's uh, called Growing Older, where we talk about um, financial abuse, you know, different resources for seniors. And Rianne will get into some of these um, additional resources. We also have a section on wills and estate planning. I know that during this pandemic, we had seen an increase in the visits to this particular section of our site because many people were thinking about getting their financial affairs in order during this time. We talk about the fact that we're growing older and as we get older, you know, we may be faced with challenges. So you always want to be prepared for the unexpected. What we heard, um, you know, there have been several studies lately and it said that many Canadians, about a third of them, weren't prepared for unexpected expenses. So we have tools like an emergency fund calculator. We also have something called a personal information inventory form. And really this is a document that you would um, print out and put down personal information. And this is where you would list things like, you know, what are those key documents you have, your wills, your passport, credit cards, where are they located, um, important numbers. But on this form, you would also include important things like, who are those professionals you deal with? Who are those financial professionals? Who are those medical professionals? Who are those local, uh, legal professionals? And you would also include social media account information. You know, we're all on social media right now. We all have tablets, laptops, smartphones, everything's password protected. I know I have two cell phones. Both phones are password protected, they're locked. If someone needed to access my contact information on my behalf and needed to get into my phone, they don't have a password. They would not get that information. So we have this form that you can you know, download, print out, put down important information, share this, um, share where you've completed this form with someone you trust so that if something happens and someone needed to access information on your behalf, they can easily get that information. Another page on the website is a page called investingquestions.ca. And I, I like this page because I think it's really another great resource for people. Sometimes people will contact us, they have a question, and we will respond. If someone is asking that question, likely someone else is thinking that same question and would be interested in the answer. So we post those questions and answers on this particular page of our website. Then you know what? We live in Canada, very multilingual society, and sometimes people prefer having information in their own language. So we have a mic uh, microsite that's available in 22 languages, and it's called investingintroduction.ca. And then lastly, how do you keep in touch? How do you stay connected with information? How do you know what new resources are out there? Um, certainly we have an e-newsletter you can sign up for. It's called Investor News. Just visit our website, getspotterboutmoney.ca, and you can subscribe to the e-newsletter. We also have a Twitter channel, we have a Facebook page, and we have a YouTube channel. So various ways that you can um, keep connected get in touch with us and get information. And that said, most importantly, if you have a question, you're not sure what to do, who to contact, you can always call us. I have a toll-free number, and that's 1-877-785-1555. Uh, or you can go online. Certainly, you can contact us at getsmarterboutmoney.ca, or you can go on our corporate site, osc.ca, different ways that you can reach us and different ways that you can get answers. And that said, I'm now gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Rianne so that she can continue on this part of the presentation. Thank you, Chris, for your great presentation. Uh, I'm just seeing there's a... Sorry, something popped up on my screen. Rianne, would you like me to share my screen and I can share for you? I think I got it. Just 
just waiting for it to go to, there we go. Does everybody see that? Boy. Okay, great. So um, in terms of, I, I thought I would um, do a couple more polling questions. And um, this one is just talks about uh, knowing who to report. Um, so the question is, if you are someone you know um, was experiencing financial abuse, would you know who to tell or report to? Um, so this is for like if you experience or if you're talking to somebody and they disclose to you, um, would you know where to go? Because often we do these presentations and the people say, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what to do and where to go. And, uh, and then there's others who aren't so familiar with, you know, what services are available in their own local communities, um, not only within local, but also provincial resources uh, as well um, that are available to assist individuals. And we're fortunate to have the Ontario Securities Commission um, and that they can help solve uh, or ask questions and their great website, which I, I took a note out because I think that's a great resource to be able to ask questions um, because, uh, you know, you could put a question in there and say, who do I report to? Because um, I'm sure that many other individuals have that same kind of question. So I'm just going to uh, stop the poll. I think we have about 70 people that presented or that responded. Um, so 69% of individuals said yes. Um, but there is still about a third of individuals that say they are not quite sure where to report to. And that's not uncommon. Um, what we find um, when we do these uh, presentations and we do some outreach is that oh, about one-fifth or 21% of seniors who experience financial abuse really don't know who to talk to. They don't know who to reach out to or tell about their situation. And that's kind of concerning because when, you know, financial resources and assets are extremely important to individuals. So if they don't know who to help, then that abuse or financial um, uh, abuse will continue or that exploitation if they don't know who to or reach out to or seek assistance from. So the next question I just have is, um, can you name... Uh, as services in your region or where you live or provincially, who can assist victims? So you may know who to report to. So often the people say we're police, that's kind of a common response. Um, but do you actually know the names of other resources besides uh, police services to report uh, abuse in your, in your local area? People that maybe be able to help with uh, financial counseling, for, for instance, um, uh, credit counseling, uh, even uh, services for emotional well-being, about counseling um, uh, for a community, uh, your mental health and well-being, that kind of thing. Knowing those services, it's not just uh, particularly finances, because as we indicated before, abuse crosses over in the different um, uh, the different forms of abuse, whether that's emotional or physical. Um, so, who can help that individual? So, sixty percent of individuals indicate that they do know, know where the services are available in their region, which is great. But there are still some people who aren't. And I think the one thing that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about resources um, is to find out, we have to do the research ourselves. So in this survey that was done, again, this is going back to that survey that was done in, in British Columbia or Vancouver, um, was that more than 80% of respondents could not name any support services available. And a lot of times we're very reactive individuals. As a population, we don't go to seek information until we absolutely need it. Um, however, we need to be a little bit proactive, I think, in the work that and the uh, in our own financial well-being, um, in our own mental health well-being, to find out what services are there, just even scope it out so we know who we could reach out to just in case. Or if it's that neighbor uh, or friend that we hear about. So we you know, aren't maybe caught off, off guard and saying, well, I have no idea what to do. Um, but if you, even if we don't know, we can do the research to find out. Google is our friend, <laughs> um, which is, is awesome. Um, uh, we have resources. And even if you reach out to one agency, they may know other organizations that can help you along the way as well. So I know most people probably indicate the police as a, as a resource for reporting, which is great. Um, because we know that there, the abuse of financial um, fraud, forgery, 
abuse of power of attorney, those are criminal offenses that the police can lay charges on um, if they have uh, evidence to proceed. So knowing your uh, local OPP or financial law enforcement agency or service is great. If there's a, fraud, a scam, as I believe that was, uh, that was illustrated in the uh, example that Jennifer provided, the Canadian Anti-Fraud System or Canadian Fraud Centre, sorry, is a great resource, not only for getting information about for current frauds and scams that are out there, but also to report uh, information to them. Now, saying that if you are a victim within your region um, of financial abuse, you should report that to your police department. Um, the finance, the, the anti-fraud center needs to know about that and will work in collaboration with their local services to do investigations. Um, but they do also want to know, um, sometimes it's hard to track down these scamsters that are um, maybe not living within Ontario, but maybe uh, across a different part of the world. Um, but they do work together to try to um, bring those those fraudsters down um, so they don't, uh, other old, older adults and uh, individuals don't become victims of those same crimes. So there is also a, a, a group that's got together, it's called LEAPS, which is Law Enforcement Agencies Protecting Seniors. And this is a, a, a committee of officers um, and provincial uh, partners, including LWS Prevention Ontario um, and um, uh, Ontario Public Guardian Trustee. There's many organizations, banking uh, law firms or banking firms um, that we get together and just we um, we talk about um, you know some of the current trends in frauds. So we're better equipped. And there's senior support officers across Ontario in different departments who have a hat that they wear in terms of uh, senior abuse. So they may be called different names. They could be a senior support officer, um, a vulnerable persons officer. It all depends on the department and what they're called. But if you don't know, call your local service and find out if they have an officer that deals specifically with senior support issues. Um, you can also report anonymously to Crime Stoppers. Um, to get that info to report a situation that you're concerned about. If you don't want to, um, if you want to be anonymous and you don't want to give your name, then that's an option and the police will then follow up on that. This is a great resource if you're not sure if you have been, um, if someone has taken your identity or someone's, you know, you're, you don't know what your credit report is. Once a year, you can uh, apply to Equifax um, and TransUnion to get a report on your um, on your credit report. And so I've included the phone number and there's a website where you can go online and, and request that. So again, it's a it's um, it's good to do that. You can also put an alert on your form if you've been a scam, just in case something uh, strange happens. Um, and if you become a victim, that you could put that on there as well. If you're looking for some legal services or legal supports, um, the Law Society Referral Service does provide 30 minutes of free legal consultation, and then they can refer you to a lawyer within the region that you live um, that can. Uh, that has the expertise within the area of law that you're looking for. So you can go on their website and um, and put in information that you're what you're looking for, and then they will uh, link you up with a with the lawyer who will have some consultation with you, and then give you that free legal advice as well. Um, so that's uh, the law referral service. Uh, awesome resources, the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, which many people I'm sure on this uh, call may be familiar with. Um, they are part of legal aid and they have lawyers um, who are very uh, educated and deal with elder abuse all the time. And you'll see them in uh, the media, I'm sure. Um, particularly, I know in the last uh, two years around the abuse in long-term care homes and advocate for seniors in care, um, but also advocating and for your financial well-being as well. So they're a great resource. They have lots of information on their website. So I'd encourage you to go there. Um, the other resource is um, other legal clinics is the South Asian Legal Clinic, um, have similar resources and information. Um, they serve the senior, uh, sorry, the South Asian community. Um, in terms of human rights, there's a human rights tribunal and then the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. And if you go on our website, we've done many presentations with the uh, Ontario Public Guardian Trustee when there's concerns about an individual who's not uh, capable of understanding, appreciating circumstances, and they're at risk of harm. Um, and so I would encourage you maybe go back on our website just to check some of those presentations because um, they, they will do investigations when there is a, a significant 
uh, risk to an individual. So that's all the question, the uh, information I have to present. I know there's lots of questions that have been coming up in the Q&A box. So I'm going to um, stop my screen share to spend some time answering some of those questions with Chris and Jennifer, if you wanna join us. Um, and uh, I'll let Mary start the, the questions. Perfect, thank you. First of all, again, thank you to Chris, to Jennifer and to Rianne. We've had such um, a flurry of comments in the comment box about the great information spoken at a well paced, very clear and concise. And there was special shout outs to our ASL interpreters as well. So thank you uh, to both ASL interpreter one and two for the amazing work they do with us. So a lot of questions as Rianne had let us know. First and foremost, people are talking about how do we start that conversation about bringing up a trusted contact person if perhaps there's already a POA in place or a substitute decision maker, how do we introduce that conversation? And I know, Chris, we, you had talked about, we don't talk about it. And sometimes culturally, we don't talk about it within the family. So how do we now have that conversation and introduce having a, a, a trusted contact uh, person in the life of a senior? Certainly, um, I know and you're right, it, it, sometimes it is a cultural thing and sometimes it's even comfort level discussing finances and there is no easy way. Um, you just have to bring it up. Now I'm gonna to defer to Jennifer to maybe you know talk a little bit more about this because she may have a little more insight and a little more information on how people might wanna approach this. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, that's a great question. And. And I think the, the real um, change that the regulatory framework that I spoke about and presented on will bring about is, is the fact that their, the financial advisors will be required to bring it up uh, with their clients come December 31st. We, so we understand that actually many financial advisors do um, ask about trusted contact person of their clients, but uh, you know it's, it's kind of a voluntary thing at this point for firms that feel that that, that is um, a helpful tool and um, helpful resource to help protect their clients. But um, as of the end of this year, all financial advisors that are registered um, to provide financial advice um, or trade and securities, they will be required to ask the question of clients. So uh, even for those who haven't started thinking about it, uh, hopefully that'll prompt um, investors to think about it. and at every, um, you know, we, we call it the know your client update. So, you know, financial advisors are required to check in with their clients, um, you know, at regular intervals. And at those intervals, we also require them to check in about trusted contact persons. Has anything changed? Is this the, still the person that you want to appoint as a trusted contact person? Or, you know, for investors who at the time didn't uh, have anybody that came to mind, you know, if they have changed their minds about uh, appointing somebody or, you know, a new person comes to mind, you know, th those are conversations that now we're requiring people to have. So hopefully um, that will help investors kind of start the conversation. I can just add to that, Mary. The um, I think too, it's, um, having the conversation as an older adult with someone that you want to appoint right i think that is also that um it's it, it can be difficult because finances is a personal issue you know nobody really wants to say yeah you know i've got five hundred thousand dollars invested with so and so do you mind talking to them if something happens <laughs> so sometimes that can be really uncomfortable plus it's a privacy issue so mm -hmm. i think it, you, you need to sort of take some time to think about as as chris and jennifer said who you want to talk to and that doesn't mean you need to disclose what you owe or what you own and the amount of money you have invested that's it's if there's a problem if they can just you they can reach out to you to talk to right i think and um but it is still difficult because people might start asking more questions that you might be uncomfortable with and it's it's like advanced planning we need to ask these difficult questions or, or have people understand why we're asking them because you trust them um because you want to protect your interests but you don't I don't, I, I mean, I'm not up, up to date on all the trusted contact information because it's fairly new to myself. I'm just learning today as well. So, um, but these are, I think these are important points that are people are bringing up um, that I think the Ontario Security Commission can build into some of their educational tools when we start thinking about how we have that supportive conversation with someone to reach out to the friend to, you know, name them that person. So when they get 
talk to their advisor and say, yes, Mary Jane, my neighbor is the person I can identify and Mary Jane's not caught off guard. So the advisor knows, right? So um, it was a great question. Exactly. And then I think in leading to that, a uh, few um, the questions came in saying, if the senior themselves does not want to report the abuse, the financial abuse, could the trusted contact person begin that reporting, but are they able to do so if the senior is not the one coming forward to report it, but they want to report on their behalf because they know it's been happening? I, I, I guess I could, I could start uh, with, you know, I think it, it's so difficult and, uh, you know, in our stakeholder engagement, I, we hear this a lot that, you know, often investors are, are you know, financially exploited, taken advantage of, and they recognize that and they know it, but they themselves, if, especially if it's a family member, they don't want to go to the law enforcement and they don't want to take them to court. Um, so in those, it's an incredibly difficult uh, situation. For the trusted contact person, it's really the, the reason it's so important that the investor choose somebody that they trust um, that knows them well is because the trusted contact person when you know faced with this situation they'll need to make a judgment call as to what needs to happen you know as securities regulators we, we can't we don't regulate what the trusted contact person do but you know I'm thinking if I were a trusted contact for person for my father for example and I'm contacted by his financial advisor about you know him being financially uh, abused by somebody, then, you know, I, I, I surely would take it upon myself to make sure he gets the support that he needs. You know, if, if law enforcement should be involved, then maybe I might involve him, even if he might think, you know, like, I don't really want anybody to know about it. So uh, it's really the role of the, t you know, it's up to the TCP to, t to determine what's, what's appropriate. I'm just going to ask, there's a question um, regarding to the Office of Public Guardian Trustee. So when would the advisor contact the uh, uh, Ontario, the Office of the Public Guardian Trustee? And can the hold be over the whole account if the actions are on all of them? And does the advisor have to wait more for more suspicious activity to place a hold on each uh, of the accounts? So they're kind of, they're from the same person. So I know they're from the PG. The, the uh, PGAT kind of um, maybe focus. So does the advisor contact the public guardian trustee themselves if they suspect something or do they have to contact the uh, trusted contact maybe first or do they can they call the, the public guardian trustee if they know the person may be at risk if there's, so what if the, I, I guess I'm, I'm gonna throw a scenario. What if they call the trusted contact person they say, yes, you know, Mary has is showing signs of dementia. So then, then the advisor knows, do they contact public guardian trustee? I'm not sure how that works. I'm, maybe I'm, if I'm not getting that correct, maybe you can type your, your question back in, Denise. Anybody know the answer to that? Uh, so in terms of reporting, you know, our regulations really focus on the trusted contact person, but we do recognize that there's um, a w wide variety of support that uh, the advisor or the trusted contact person or the the client um, could rely on uh, one of them being the Ontario Public Guardian and Trustee. And depending on the circumstances, it might be appropriate to contact uh, the, the the Public Guardian and Trustee. Um, we I, and I think it, there's also the added complexity of privacy legislation. So, um, in a client agreement between the financial advisor and the client, there may be uh, restrictions or, or you know, the client explicitly consents to the advisor contacting third parties in certain circumstances. So I think it's, it's very situation specific. Mary? Yeah, a few questions have come out and this is, this is of interest to myself as well. Can a financial advisor also act as the POA for uh, their client? So, so I, I think this is more, uh, th this relates to the work of our colleagues uh, who work on the client focus reforms. And um, so I, I think there have been uh, conversations about whether uh, financial advisors should be prohibited from mm -hmm. acting as a part of attorney. Um, this isn't my area of expertise, but my understanding is that there's no active prohibition, but uh, 
I, it, it, you know, we, we don't encourage it because there, there could be uh, opportunities for abuse. You know, we, we have heard about uh, horror cases where that goes awfully wrong. Um, I, I think recently there were actually cases from the SRO self-regulatory organizations who actually took disciplinary, disciplinary action against their member uh, advisors um, who were acting as part of attorney or their family members who were also the clients of the firms who just didn't act appropriately. Understood. So it's technically not illegal, but it's ethically, morally wrong, definitely. So as we know, as things change, as we move forward with understanding who should be the power of attorney and now looking to that trusted contact person as well. So thank you. Rianne, did you want to do the next question or? Oh, go ahead. Perfect. Like typing of response. <laughs> no worries. There, so there's quite a bit um, of, of more coming through, definitely. So um, really, I guess uh, we've got some stakeholders from PG&T sort of saying, so with, with many, there is no trusted contact. So hence the question was really, do the banks contact the public guardian from time to time? If knowing that there is no trusted contact, there is no PA, there is no really sometimes friends and family in one's life. And I know many of our stakeholders on today work with very many vulnerable seniors who there may just be no one in their lives to help protect them. So would the bank's role then be to contact the public guardian or yourselves? What would sort of be the next role to protect a senior from being taken advantage of? Jennifer, Chris, want to jump in there? I, I'm I'm no expert, but I'm going to say, you know what, you know, Rianne shared um, several seniors organizations yeah. that can assist. And certainly if dependent on what it is, the success, they, um, they suspect it might be that they might need to bring in uh, law enforcement, or it may be that they need to bring in um, the office of the public guardian and trustee. So dependent on the situation, and if there is no one that can act in or advocate for the senior or, or that client, then I would say um, you should be reaching out to one of these organizations to see if they can assist. I don't know if there's anyone else that wants to jump in and add on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would, uh, I would agree. If they don't have anyone and that's where we, you know, we talk about, you know, it's the beginning of the presentation about, you know, taking some action because the person may be in financial straits, dire straits, and they don't know, they don't have the capacity or don't know who to reach out to, um, that we can assist in that process. And um, the lack of reporting of, or of the barriers, there's many barriers to um, not wanting to report. Uh, and we do have to appreciate that uh, individuals have a choice if they're capable of doing so, then they don't want to report. But I think we just don't give up. I think we need to educate individuals about what their rights are and uh, provide them information and keep checking back to make sure where they're at. And if they want to, that you could support them along that way or that journey um, with them. Um, maybe they don't feel comfortable going alone or they, they need that support or just more clarity on what will happen if. So I think that that's important too, just understanding the dynamics that go along with, with that. About the uh, hold that we talked about, putting the holds on the account. And there's a few questions that have come through to ask about, um, can the holds be over the whole account if the actions are all on them? Does the advisor have to wait for more suspicious activity to place a hold on each? So maybe if you can help uh, clarify a little bit on the holds on the account and how that works. Uh, so, sorry, my computer started doing all these updates. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, for the temporary hold, uh, we, we do, you know, under the amendments, um, we, we contemplate the hold to be on specific trade, withdrawal or transfer. And, um, and it's not intended to be a hold on an entire account, you know, some, just because there's suspicion that something might be happening, putting a blanket temporary hold over financial assets of somebody, it, it's, it's a pretty significant act. Um, that being said, you know, if there are, there could be situations where, you know, a hold should be placed on, on it affects the, all the assets of the account. You know, if, for example, the, 
um, you know, investor has $100,000 in the account and, you know, there's a request to withdraw all the $100,000, you know, the temporary hold effect effectively would be placed on the entire account. Um, so, so it could happen. Sorry, was there a second part of the question? I Like, yeah, so I think you pretty much answered it. I think they were sort of asking if they hold one part, but now they know more fraudulent activity is happening. Will they begin to hold other assets or um, finances, or do they need more proof to go along to hold that until uh, money is being, you know, taken out of the account fraudulently? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, proof, like under the our, our framework, you know, we... It's, it's really based on reasonable belief of the advisor, you know, proof of actual financial exploitation isn't necessarily required. If there are red flags, there's warning signs and there's, you know, real concern that once this money leaves the account, it's it's going not going to be used. And, and you know, it, it's because of financial exploitation or because of a lack of mental capacity, then, you know, those those would be uh, subject to the hold that a firm, you know, decides to place. I just have one quick question on that. So the documentation um, or evidence uh, that they have, who does that? Who does the um, financial advisor submit that information to? The Securities Commission to make that judgment call, or how does that process work? Uh, so under under the framework, um, what we have required is that the the reasonable belief has to be held by the firm, and in effect, what that really means is that. An individual advisor, just because they they saw a few red warning signs, they sh shouldn't be just able to place a temporary hold. Like it's it's a significant block to, you know, an investor's act right to access their their financial assets. So, um, what what it, effectively the requirement for the firm to have reasonable belief does is to require them to have escalation processes. So, you know, any decision to place a hold has to be made by the designated legal or compliance or supervisory uh, staff that has the authority to approve that kind of a uh, temporary hold. Okay, thanks. And Jennifer, on that topic, there has been um, quite a few, uh, you had put one case scenario about sending funds overseas to the wife you've never met. We've worked here at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario with sadly many scam cases that seniors are being uh, taken advantage of to send money uh, around the world on all sorts of different scams. So as the trusted contact person, what would they need to bring forward as I know you just talked a little bit about that, but to say, you know, my, my relative is being taken advantage of by either a romance scam or, or scam being told they're going to win millions in Bitcoin or, or whatever the current scam of the day may be to protect them and stop the funds as quickly as possible from, from coming out. But like you just said, ultimately, if I'm the investor, it's my money. And I no, I want to send that money because yes, I'm going to meet the love of my life overseas eventually. So how, how do we draw that fine line between the person who's trying to protect you and the person who's saying, nope, it's all real. It's happening. I believe this is happening. Yeah, no, I, I think you articulated it really well that it's all it's a balancing act, right? Because one, you want to and we all want to help protect, you know, older and vulnerable investors and we all want to do our part for that. But at the same time, we have to respect a, an investor's autonomy and their right to make decisions. You know, you know, sometimes a, 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 a client who's not vulnerable, let's say somebody who's fully capable they know they're being taken advantage of and they're spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or, you know, or, or tens, you know, hundreds of dollars, whatever it is. And they, they know they're being uh, taken advantage of, but they, they're okay to do that. And they're okay to lose out on that. And so, you know, I, it, again, it's, I think it's very circumstance uh, specific and, you know, having to balance that need to protect them, but at the same time, respecting their wishes, if, if, if they're fully aware of, of the situation and accepting of it. Yeah. If they appreciate the risk, okay. If they don't, possibly, yeah. I think just to clarify, there was a there, just a question about would the trusted contact person only make decisions the next about the next steps, um, you know, financial abuse, if there's concerns about the POA, if there was no POA. So 
my understanding from what you said is that the trusted contact person doesn't make decisions. They're just sort of verifying the information that the advisor is having. Is that correct? That's correct. So they wouldn't be able to make any trades or, or decisions on the account. Um, they're really act as a, uh, there to act as a resource and how they act as that resource could just really depend on the person who's appointed as a trusted contact person. It could be anywhere from just providing information to the advisor that might be helpful for the advisor to conclude, yes, there's financial exploitation, or maybe this person just has a quirky personality, you know, or um, the trusted contact person taking further steps outside of that advisor contacts and doing what they need to do to help the, the client. And it's really up to that trusted contact person. Great. Anything else, Mary? Thank you. Just sort of, I'm just looking just to be mindful of everybody for a time, but uh, we've covered off quite a bit of uh, the questions that have come through in general from our audience. There's still, uh, you know, a lot of conversation back and forth. A lot of people have brought up, you know, certain situations, personal. So of course we want to let them know to either reach out to us or you can, they can reach out directly uh, to you at the uh, OSC commission. And we can look at that, you know, on a more one-on-one -on -one personal basis. So, but thank you so much for, for that Q&A. And I think that really brought some good information in helping understand more and more as we define clear what a trusted contact person means, changes happening through our banking and financial systems, because it's about protecting our older adults and our most vulnerable, definitely, as we all want to age well and need to put those prevention measures in place. So thank you so much. I've learned a lot today. So thank you, both Chris and uh, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. I'm just going to um, let people know. I think I have. I think my screen is up again. Yes. Um, so we do have more webinars coming up. Um, we are going to be partnering with the Ontario Securities Commission again on November 30th. We will be hosting another webinar, so stay tuned. Um, but our next webinar is on November 16th, and we're working with the uh, with 08, the Ontario. Um, uh, Association of Interval Transition Houses um, on Older Women, uh, Gender-Based Violence and Femicide in Ontario. Uh, this month is also um, uh, Women Abuse uh, Month and we're uh, doing some work in terms of prom um, promoting awareness around this issue of, of older women um, being victims of violence and femicide. So um, stay tuned, you'll be getting more information in regards to that. I did again uh, with Mary, I wanna thank both Christine and Jennifer for joining us. I did put um, the, the contact information is there. And as Mary indicated, tomorrow, hopefully I will have the um, PowerPoint and the recording up on our website. And in a follow-up email that you get from uh, your registration on Zoom, we'll provide you with that connection for the, uh, with, the, with the link to the website that will take you right to the uh, webinar page. Um, and again, just the evaluation, if you take, uh, it's not even a minute, probably take you half a minute just to answer. I think there's seven questions um, based on uh, the evaluation for the session today. We appreciate your feedback. Um, if you want to get in contact with uh, myself or Mary, there's our contact information for our office and our website, our contact information for all the consultants in our office and director um, for the organization is there as well. Uh, lastly, I want to thank our ASL interpreters today. Uh, I know they're greatly appreciated from our uh, audience and members um, as well. And we continue to provide ASL for all of our webinars um, throughout the year. So um, we appreciate their uh, service um, joining us today. So thank you both again. Um, and thank everybody. And um, we look forward to you attending our next webinar.